Hello, thank you for tuning into the program today. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Our guest is Dr. Timothy Craig. He's professor of medicine and pediatrics at Pennsylvania State University. With us today to discuss some new FDA approvals concerning preventing hereditary angioedema. Welcome to the program, Dr. Timothy Craig. Thanks so much for joining us today. No, thank you very much. So, um, although most of our listeners are healthcare professionals, what is hereditary angioedema? Yes, so hereditary angioedema, it's a genetic disease, autosomal dominant. affects about 1 in 50,000 people. Okay. Uh, so not very common, but uh, prior to, you know, in the last decade, there weren't any therapies, so mm -hmm. people often weren't even looked for or diagnosed. But what happens is most people have about uh, 22 attacks a year. Attacks last three days and it involves either the skin or the abdominal uh, tract, leading to obstruction, pain, or even the worst thing is actually swelling of the upper airway. And thus, it's uh, since the if you figure that out, I think it comes out to be about seventy to eighty attack uh, days of uh, disability a year. So it's an uh, obvious restriction on quality of life and promotion in the jobs and anxiety and travel ones and so on. So it's a disease not only of recurrent pain and swelling and disfigurement, but also, you know, uh, inhibition of productivity and so on. Now, if I'm understanding correctly, this is a disease that not only inflames the outside of the body on the surface of the skin, but also the digestive tract as well. Yes, yeah, so a GI tract. So swelling of the intestines, and that causes obstruction. So you have uh, cramping, belly pains, nausea, vomiting, and without treatment can last three days. And then the worst outcome would be swelling of the upper airway. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, so that only happens in maybe one or three percent of attacks, but it can be fatal if not treated right away. Now, you mentioned having no treatment whatsoever up until the last decade or so. Yeah, so, um, you know, in the 2008 to about 2011, uh, there were actually four medications uh, came to market, um, three of them for treating acute attacks, one for preventing acute attacks. And the only thing that was really available prior to that time was androgens, uh, which work, uh, but they have quite a lot of adverse effects, especially in females and children, and then fresh frozen plasma for rescue from an attack. So up up until that time, um, when the approval came on, obviously there are drugs available. The, um, the one for prophylaxis was about 50% effective, maybe more in open label studies, but not 90% not effective. And then the other three medications that I mentioned were actually just to take if, when you had an attack. And they are, all three of them are rather effective. Does this disease attack mainly older people or can it attack anyone at any time? Usually kids before puberty um, don't have many attacks. I do have a few of the kids I take care of have uh, frequent attacks actually and that's usually a, a bad omen for the future that they'll continue to have a severe um, presentation throughout life. But it's usually right around puberty uh, when attacks really increase in frequency. And probably the reason for that is estrogen. Estrogen and ACE inhibitors are two drugs these people can never be on. So are there any genetic tests that can um, determine a person's whether or not they have the, uh, the gene for this disease or not? Yeah, there is a genetic test. It's rather expensive. And actually the biologic test for the C1 inhibitor protein, uh, which is what's deficient, as well as the function of that protein, and actually, it has nothing to do with the swelling, but we would look at the fourth component of complement as probably the best screening test for the disease. So most of us just de de depend on the biologic tests that are easy to get in the country and uh, reliable, and I should say relatively reliable, uh, but um, easy to obtain and very cost effective. Before we get into this uh, new therapy that we're going to talk about, what would you say are the greatest challenges or unmet needs when um, someone's suffering from hereditary angioedema? Yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, right now our acute uh, therapies for an attack work rather well. And, uh, you know, it's just that you always have to be prepared. Um, and uh, with the prophylactic medications out there being danosol or androgens, uh, which have a lot of adverse effects, and then also C1 inhibitor, uh, but it's all given by the IV 
route now, and it's, again, at the doses FDA approved, it's only about 50%, maybe a little greater than that, effective. And what's happening now is, the unfortunately, the therapy has to be given IV twice a week, and that becomes a rather big uh, therapeutic burden for most people. So I think the biggest need right now is to have a different route um, of therapy as well as to have a prophylactic therapy that's like 90% effective or greater or 85% or greater. So people really can depend on not having attacks so they can go about, you know, flying in planes and going on vacation and, you know, showing up at work on time every day. And so, I, I you know, that's what I really see the biggest need in the diseases right now. Toward that end, the FDA has uh, done some recent approval for treatment uh, to prevent this uh, this condition. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, I'm just trying to think maybe it was two weeks ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, the FDA approved a, a, a drug that's called Hegata. Mm -hmm. And what that is, it's, um, it's a super concentrated uh, form of Bainer. Bainer is C1 inhibitor, human-derived. Uh, it's been given IV in the past for rescue, off-label for um, prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. But now um, it's going to be in a sub-Q form and highly concentrated. Instead of 50 units per milliliter, it's going to be 500, mil, uh, 500 units per milliliter. So what will happen is people will no longer have to use the intravenous route. They'll just give it subcutaneous, still be twice a week, mm -hmm. um, but uh, hopefully people will have uh, uh, be... Uh, more but, tolerance of yeah, the dosage. Much, much less of a physical burden. Yeah. That's correct, right. And the other thing with that, too, is its efficacy because the doses are going to be much higher, even though the bioequivalent or bioavailability is lower. Uh, the benefit is going to be in the 90s, it seems, uh, at least when the phase three studies uh, demonstrate it to be over 90% effective at uh, alleviating attacks. Do you see um, any relief in some of the... Um uh, financial burden of this uh, this new drug as it relates to preventing HAE? Well, yes, there is some because uh, right now um, people who are really severe especially can use many rescue uh, therapies per month. And the rescue therapies run about 10000 in injection. Okay. Often, you know, some being it's a little cheaper Rukiness is a little more expensive, but that's what we usually say, about $10,000 an injection. So if you have someone using eight of them, you can see how that would really add up over a year. So actually, prophylaxis, that's of 90% or greater effect, will reduce significantly acute management of the acute treatment for the disease, and hopefully it'll be a cost savings right there. Now, what advice would you give to other healthcare professionals when they're talking with their patients in order to better understand HAE and also to give some advice as to when is the best time to seek treatment? Yeah, so it's really hard. You know, we've tried to dis develop um, uh, protocols for when people should go on prophylaxis. Um, but, you know, there is no real right answer for that, mm -hmm. only because there are some people who have a very poor quality of life with one attack a month and other people who have three or four attacks per month and are using rescue medication or on-demand therapy, which is a term that we use, and do very well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would argue that that patient having one attack a month is really compromised and not productive and very anxious, that person might even benefit more from prophylaxis than say that person has many attacks per month, but you know, somehow uses their rescue medication early, gets good symptom relief in just a matter of an hour, is back to doing their usual responsibilities and usual, you know, has a decent quality of life. So it's really hard to say who should be on prophylaxis and who's not. And across the board, when we've got no professionals together who focus in this area, we can never really come to a consensus on that issue. But the one consensus we do have for acute treatment, the earlier you use it, the better. If you wait many hours into an attack, the failure rate of responding is greater. You also have that morbidity and potential mortality associated with those hours that you don't treat. So, you know, I think uh, the other important concept there, whether or not you're on prophylaxis, you always have to be prepared to treat an acute attack in case it does happen. And again, you should always have your therapy on you so you can treat at the very early signs and symptoms. And where can we go and learn more about this uh, newly approved drug, Hygarda? Yeah, so actually there's a 
there's a um, patient uh, community, uh, a patient association called HAEA. Uh, so HAEA stands for Hereditary Angiodema of America. And it's uh, actually the best source, I think, for people to get data. And there's also a website for Agata now. And you can go to, I think it's agata.com. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I do say uh, when you're out there looking around on the web now, there is a lot of poor data out there about HAE. Um, and so that's why I always suggest people go to the HAEA website if they're really looking for expert data that's been assessed properly by professionals and that you can depend on it. I appreciate you giving us this information today, and I'm hoping that you'll come back and talk with us in some future uh, segments. That sounds great. And you have a great day, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, with Dr. Timothy Cray, Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics at Pennsylvania State University Medical School. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm. Be sure and visit our affiliates page when you visit us at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au.